Raghu, thank you so much for coming on to Startup Steroid today. I'm really excited to interview you. It took us a couple of tries to make the connection, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we finally have you on the line. Um, today, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to talk to founders and uh, give them uh, solid, actionable advice on what they need to do, uh, how they need to approach accelerators, how they need to approach investors. Um, we'll also have some tip for new investors who are just starting out, who might be making their first, second investment right now. Um, but before we get into all of those actionable advices, let's start with your background and uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you sort of uh, came into this industry. Uh, happy Sunday, uh, Dhawal. It's such a pleasure. Uh, you know, it's been fun, you know, working with you. Anshuman and Ashish, you know, with Thai, but more importantly, you know, I've had so much fun talking about, you know, this wonderful endeavor that, you know, you guys have launched in Startup Steroids. Uh, again, it's such a pleasure to be on the uh, Startup Steroids platform as well as with Thai, you know, Los Angeles region. Uh, in terms of my background, you know, I've, I've got quite a varied background. You know, I even as a kid, you know, I grew up you know, between uh, England and India, you know, I have my father, grandfather, and they, and we have some English lineage further up our, uh, you know, in our, uh, you know, three generations up. So as a kid, you know, I grew up between uh, UK and India, but I've come from a generation of uh, mining engineers. So growing up, you know, you know, come from a generation, you know, where typically you follow the footstep of your father or grandfather, et cetera. So in my undergrad days, at one point I was interested in becoming an aerospace engineer, but ended up following my dad and granddad's footsteps, you know. Uh, so I went to high school and I was academically very gifted. So I went to one of the best schools in Eastern India, extremely competitive, it was probably one of the most competitive schools to get into. But early days, you know, I did spend some of my formative years, formative years in England, uh, finished my high school, and then my undergrad is from a school that used to be called Royal School of Mines, which in due course of time, Indian School of Mines, which is now an IIT, which, you know, we all know is, you know, the top tier engineering schools in India. So I finished my undergrad in mining and petroleum, Worked in industry for two years. Again, part of my experience in India and part of it in Europe. But I never liked the field, uh, so I was all you know, always focused, you know, in a, in coming to grad, graduate school, followed with an MBA. So I knew early on I'm going to do that. So I applied to graduate schools in India, US, and UK, and I got into schools in all the three places. But I chose the United States. And this was in 1986-87. I got into Imperial College London, and I was very close to going there, but I chose Columbia University, New York. So I came to the U.S. in 1986, December, and I did two back-to-back -back graduate degrees, but my early days of entrepreneurship were sown right there. So my first degree was in a combination of computer science, mathematics, with mineral engineering, Columbia University. I was there for two semesters, but all three of my advisors, you know, moved up in their career value chain. You know, one became uh, head of school of mineral engineering at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So, you know, he pulled, so Dr. Professor Donald Cook, he moved to Alaska. And then all of my three graduate advisors, you know, Professor uh, Scott Huang and Professor Mitunja Sen Gupta, they all moved to University of Alaska Fairbanks. So eventually wow. graduated, I transferred from Columbia to University of Alaska, finished my MS. I followed it up back to back with an MBA from University of Illinois. So my MBA was funded by a German company called Biosdorf, you know, better known for the Nivea uh, cream. Uh, you know, they were a pretty big company now. They're about a $10 billion company, but my MBA was funded by them. So I finished my MBA in 1992, you know, and had some, you know, world-class experience, summer internships, and even winter internships, you know, 
including you know exposure to you know world class manufacturing and early days if you know what CAD CAM which is computer assisted design yeah. and manufacturing and what had happened was Beiersdorf had acquired an Anglo American tape company called Tessa Tuck company out of Illinois you know they had six plants around the world uh, in Germany in uh, England in France and, and three plants in the US. So early days, you know, I got some really good exposure for world-class manufacturing with ERP, you know, and uh, robotics, you know, and, you know, the U.S., Anglo-U.S. companies, you know, was not as advanced, you know, so they brought in world-class manufacturing. So yeah. fast tracking quickly, you know, I, you know, moved into management consulting after four years at Biosdorf. I moved, I moved to KPMG, you know, did uh corporate finance and manufacturing related erp for three years met my wife in the mid 90s she's of indian origin uh she has a phd in uh, macromolecular biology she's a very smart woman she went to id madras and indian institute of science you know which is probably india's premier you know you know science institute so we met in the us though she was doing a postdoc at mit and uh, purdue which is where we met we met at uh, East Meets West concert. We had some big names like Ravi Shankar, Pandit Ravi Shankar, yeah. George Harrison, etc. So that's where we met. So I was at KPMG those days. You know, uh, she was at Purdue. We got married in '95 and moved to San Diego in '95 December. And since then, we've been uh, based in San Diego. Uh, so in '96, I moved to Oracle. I was at Oracle for a number of years. I was in uh, ERP. I was in data warehousing, business intelligence, which is the current generation of AI ML. Uh, I was there for four years. Also got involved, you know, with a lot of the Y2K problems back in the day, if you remember, mm -hmm. when the new millennia was dawning upon us. Yeah. Uh, and that's where you know i started getting into entrepreneurship what happened was if you remember uh Dhaval in the late 90s oracle and uh hp and sun microsystems were strategic partners mm -hmm. uh, apple as well you know uh steve jobs was coming back into apple after his exit you know from from uh next next yeah. So, yeah, he, so, you know, Larry Ellison and Steve Jobs, you know, are very, very, you know, tight friends. So, if you remember, you know, the advertisement for Sun Microsystems, where we are in the dot in the dot com. So, I got right. involved with a lot of startups which used to use, you know, the Java driven framework, open source software on top of Oracle and Sun Microsystems. So, you know, Oracle and my son, you know, would sponsor and give away software, you know, to garner and, you know, help, you know, fuel the next generation of innovation. So that's how I got into startup. So while at Oracle, I was involved in a startup. I was at a sabbatical Oracle where I became founding CIO for a San Diego based company in market research. Uh, that's how you know I got interested in the world of entrepreneurship. Right. So I came, I went back to Oracle. That company is doing pretty well, though. The company is called Luth Research. Today it's a hundred million plus company, and it's still the work I did. I was there for six months as a CIO, you know, on on a on a contract basis through Oracle because Oracle had invested in them, and they given right. the you know hardware and the software. That company okay. is still doing pretty good, but that's what gave me a taste of entrepreneurship. So post Oracle, I moved to Morgan Stanley, my former boss, Daryl Davis, and uh, Vince Ferrari, you know, they were at Oracle, and they moved into Morgan Stanley as head of business and CIO. And that was the online division of Morgan Stanley Dean Vera that had merged. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, Morgan Stanley Dean Vera online, which basically, you know, enabled uh, people, you know, high net worth individuals, you know, family offices, you know, billionaires, uber wealthy people to manage their own investment, do online research, 
you know, manage their in investment properties, you know, and be more proactive in managing their investments, yet having the advantage of, you know, world-class, you know, financial advisory relationship. Right. So I was brought on to roll out the, so Morgan Stanley Dean Miller Online was well entrenched in the, uh, both the uh, U.S. markets, uh, in NASDAQ and NYZ, but Morgan Stanley and Dean Wheeler were looking to roll it out in other you know, key financial markets, specifically Europe. So uh, Daryl and uh, Vin Vinnie Ferrari, they brought me on to lead the rollout into the European uh, major financial exchanges. So I joined them as vice president of software and I rolled out the Morgan Stanley Dean Wheeler online in six key European markets. And I was also instrumentally you known in setting up a back office technology in outsourcing into Mumbai and Bangalore. So it was a phenomenal exposure you know, at the global level. And we grew quickly. You know, I, I rolled out the software in uh, London Stock Exchange, Paris Stock Exchange, uh, Frankfurt, uh, Madrid, Amsterdam, and Dublin, six key exchanges. Yeah, and we grew phenomenally. You know, uh, over a period of five years, Morgan Stanley Derivative Online was generating more than two hundred million dollars in revenues globally, more than ten million trades a day. Phenomenal success. Then nine eleven happened. If you remember, mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley Dean Witter was the largest tenant in World Trade Center. Yeah. So, and that was the second attack on World Trade Center. So Morgan Stanley was already, you know, had experienced that back in ninety six. Yep. When the World Trade Center was attacked in 93, I think. Nin 90, so, yeah, 93. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, there was, you know, a gut wrenching experience. I lost three team members who worked for me directly. In, wow. I used to report, and I used to work between the World Trade Center building, San Francisco, and London. So at that point, and I was traveling back from UK, I landed in... California on September 9th, I was supposed to travel to New York on 12th. But luckily, you know, because Morgan Stanley had gone through the experience earlier, you know, uh, we had uh, four levels of failover, you know. So we, of course, you know, we were gutted that we, you know, we lost three valuable team members. But then, you know, we didn't, you know, had, lose a single transaction because, you know, all our failovers rolled into our data centers in Utah. Right. So not a single transaction was lost and we were able to track everybody, you know, because we had that kind of, you know, business continuity planning and failover. Yep. So the reason I'm sharing, you know, is that I've been through, you know, some really, you know, uh, experiences, you know, that people experience once in a hundred years. Yep. It was, you know, really, you know, you know, puts in perspective, you know, the larger sense of life, you know, the friendship, the value of relationships. So Absolutely. anyway, you know, so post that, you know, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter online business, you know, started to slow down. And in, and in the, you know, our, by the summer of 2002, our business, you know, had shrunk to about $55 million from a peak of 200 million before 9-11. So right. Morgan Stanley Dean Witter online was rolled back into the parent. Right. So. I continued to work with Morgan Stanley until 2003 summer. And, you know, uh, our son back in 2003 had a major, you know, health issue back in 2003, you know. So once in a, you have these, you know, key things that happens in life, you know. So I was running all over the world, you know, and became very hard on my, my, my wife, who is also, like I said, you know, a world-class you know, genomic scientist and, uh, you know, uh, bioinformatics, you know, uh, a researcher, it was tough, you know, with me running around. So I ended up becoming a consultant at Morgan Stanley. So that's when, you know, I had my first run as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. So in 2003, I launched my first business as a, it was a tech, you know, strategic business and technology consulting company focused in fintech. We used to call it, you know, uh, back then, you know, we used to call it, you know, purely 
a business and technology consulting firm, but technically those were, it was financial technologies before the term FinTech was coined. Right. So over three years, you know, I had a phenomenal team, you know, some of my former colleagues at Morgan Stanley, Oracle, KPMG, who, you know, who I brought on. And over three years, you know, we grew it into a, a $15 million business. We had phenomenal clients like Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, you know, some of the biggest names in the space, Wells Fargo, Schwab, Standard & Poor's, uh, Deutsche Bank, et cetera. So in 2006, so we were bidding for a big project at Morgan Stanley. And we were one of 20 companies, uh, went through the first round and the second round, it came down to four of us. And we were against some big players. McKinsey, we were up against Accenture and uh, an Indian company, TCS. The right. project eventually went to McKinsey, but McKinsey looked at us closely and they made an offer to acquire us. So that was my first exit as an entrepreneur. We acquired for, you know, for a decent, you know, multi-million dollars. Three of us ended up, you know, joining McKinsey and I brokered, you know, an opportunity for me to join McKinsey with my wife. And we wanted to move to Asia because Asia was booming. So we moved to Asia yeah. and to quickly wrap through my background, I moved with McKinsey. I started in New York and San Francisco, but then we moved to Singapore in 2006, worked with McKinsey in the financial services, private equity, m and and pharma slash biotech practice for three years. In 2008, I entered my second phase as an entrepreneur. Again, you know, I joined uh, a company that was advised by McKinsey on a pro bono basis with, for the government of Singapore. We were living in Singapore and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So Singapore, you know, and Hong Kong never had any commodities exchange. So there was this uh, India, Hong Kong, Guangzhou based, you know, multiple multifamily offices. They had about 15 commodities exchange around Asia. So they were advised by McKinsey and I joined hands with a guy called Linus Co. and an Indian billionaire called Jignesh Shah out of Bombay. Mm -hmm. They brought me on to be founding CIO for Singapore Mercantile Exchange. So we launched the exchange in 2008 fall. And over three years, you know, we grew it into a company, you know, that was doing about $3 billion in trade. And in, at the end of 2011, we, were, we had an offer from uh, ICE, which is the Intercontinental Exchange, which is now the largest financial exchange ecosystem in the world or 150 million plus. So that was my second exit as an entrepreneur. So that's how we you know I've been very passionate about, about entrepreneurship. So right. quickly to close out my background, my last big corporate role, my family had moved back to the US. My wife had a two year uh, sabbatical at Scripps and she works at Scripps. She's been with Scripps since 95, which is what brought oh, wow. us to San Diego, yeah. like I told you. Uh, you know, we came, she's, when I came back to the U.S. after the acquisition of uh, Singapore Mercantile Exchange, uh, you know, I went back to Wall Street, did a couple of consulting gigs, but you know, I want to go back to corporate, but didn't find any big opportunities. So, my last big corporate role was what I was with. Uh, I knew this family office out of Hyderabad called the Varalvarvar family. You know, I know uh, the the son and. Uh, the son-in-law of the founder, they went to school with me at IIT in India. Oh, okay. I went to IIT Kharagpur, I didn't tell you. I went to IIT Kharagpur for one year, but then I switched to Indian School of Mines because of my father, I told you. Right. Followed my father, but I was at IIT Kharagpur for one year. So I know Santosh and uh, and Rajendra Devala, who are, you know, the holding, uh, the founding family. In India, they call them the uh, the patron family because you know they hold 40 percent of the stakes they're listed right. in Dubai so I was brought on they were eyeing a couple of strategic acquisitions you know one called Ukifa out of Barcelona Mexico and New York City and you know with all my relationships in the world of you know private equity venture capital and high net worth individuals they wanted me to come on you know as head of m and and uh, uh, chief strategy and operations officer. So that's what I took. 
So 2012 to 2016, I was there, grew the business from about 50 million to 225 million, uh, made one divestiture, made uh, 12 acquisitions, like I told you, and expanded the global footprint. VV Med Labs was primarily in our contract manufacturing outsourcing. Basically, they did all the you know manufacturing, outsource manufacturing for generic pharmaceutical drugs for tier one and tier two pharmaceutical players, you know, from the US and Europe. But you know, I was able to, you know, make them fully integrated, you know, set up, you know, what's called, you know, they were only a manufacturing shop, you know, but I set up R D facility, made an acquisition made, you know, a couple of, you know, what's called an API plants where you make all the formulations, you know, for the uh, intermediate constituents for, you know, uh, the final formulation of the pharmaceutical drugs. Mm -hmm. And the final stage, you know, is called an FDF, you know, which is where, you know, these intermediate pharmaceutical intermediates, you know, are, you know, converted and finished, you know, in the way we, take the drugs, you know, whether in the form of, a, you know, a pellet, you know, or a gel or a cap or a capsule, you know, or right. a powder, you've got a liquid. So that's called an FDF. So that was a phenomenal run. So 2017, you know, we had some major uh, personal issues. You know, my father had a massive stroke. My father-in-law was down with uh, Parkinson's disease. My son was entering, you know, it became very hard again on my wife. I was, you know, uh, I had a, you know, good, we, we met, you know, I had teams in seven countries and about four continents. It was a brutal lifestyle. Yeah. It got hard, you know, my, I all had a health issue as well. So, you know, with my father's health, with my father-in-law's health, and I needed to slow down. So looking for a transition, so that is where, you know, I met uh, people from Sway Ventures and NextQ, which have been involved for the past uh, three and a half years in, the, uh, in early 2017. Mm -hmm. so the last three and a half, four years, you know, I have been a strategic investor, advisor, uh, operator, and uh, I've done, made some investments alongside. So primarily NextQ and Sway Ventures are sister firms. And uh, they are focused in fintech. They are focused in uh, frontier tech, AI, ML, cloud, cybersecurity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, AR, VR, infrastructure, uh, and some other areas like, you know, computer vision, grid computing, uh, mobility, and uh, dig definitely digital health and health tech. Right. So over the last, uh, so NextCube, you know, just to wrap up in the next minute, NextCube has about a portfolio of 80 companies. AUM is about, you know, uh, 500 million plus. Sway Ventures is a later stage company. Both companies run separate, but Sway Ventures, you know, like a pure play uh, venture capital firm out of Silicon Valley. They have 60 plus companies in the portfolio, but they do Series B, Series C investing. So I'm more hands-on, spend more time with NextCube, but I also, you know, work in deal flow, uh, you know, pre-merger, post-merger due diligence, uh, deal flow, you know, operations, execution, et cetera. And I work closely with the Sway Ventures guys as well. Sway Ventures and NextCube, you know, have a lot of, you know, common board members, but they run as, you know, separate companies. Independent companies. But, you know, strategically, you know, they are very, you know, they're very close, they're seamlessly interlinked. You know, we have a lot of family offices invested in both. Uh, the founder of, the two key founders, that's why I know are major investors in, in NextCube. But, you know, both companies run, run separately, they have independent boards. Right. So, yeah, uh, at a personal level, you know, I, at the moment, you know, I am working with about 10 companies. I'm a strategic advisor, you know, with, you know, I can, you know, share a few names of companies like Fanalyze, yep. company like, you know, Zykara. I'm also, you know, a venture partner at, you know, a venture firm called iBoss, you know, where uh, Ravi Sharma and Anand are involved. 
I work with, you know, with a series C company called Bitwar, which is a fintech deep learning platform. I'm yep. a strategic advisor there. And I work with a couple of companies, you know, in uh, blockchain in fintech, whose name I cannot share because, you know, yep. <laughs> I'm also involved, you know, with uh, a world class $150 million fund, you know, again, they're in stealth mode, but they're in regenerative medicine and they are being uh, spun out of uh, Harvard. Okay. And they have created 10 unicorns, including Moderna and Gilead. Wow. Okay. So I'm a strategic advice there as well. But that's in a nutshell me. Right. No, that, that, that's incredible. You have a absolutely amazing background and relationships all over the world. So this actually makes you perfect uh, to be an advisor in startups and to sort of guide uh, new companies. Um, now let's, you, you said you're, you are essentially working with about 10 companies right now. What, if let's say the 11th guy is watching right now and wants to reach out to you, what are some of the criteria that you generally look for from investors in startups? Um, do you have a vision in mind uh, when you're having that conversation to see if uh, it's the right fit? Oh, that's a good question. Absolutely. You know, uh, so it's sector specific. So obviously, you know, we look at, you know, the sectors they operate in, you know, since I am focused in frontier tech, digital health tech, and, you know, and, and, and fintech, you know, I can speak to these specific sectors. Obviously, you know, Nescube and Sway look beyond that too, you know, and I have an eye for smarter companies. But some of the key, you know, differentiators we look for in companies is, you know, what is their, you know, uh, what's the core problem they're solving, uh, you know, how they differentiate themselves, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the competitors, you know, how big is, you know, the, the space they are targeting, the, you know, the total addressable market, the serviceable addressable market, yep. serviceable obtainable, you know, the TAM, SAM, SOM, you know, these yep. acronyms I'm sure, you know, you're aware of. We look at the team, we look at their past track record, you know, we look at the uh, people, you know, the, you know, the investors, you know, in, invested in them, if some of the key members, you know, are, you know, have had, you know, a track record as entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. have they had exits, but some of the key things, you know, that you know, really strike us, you know, as mar if they have market leadership position. You know, obviously, you know, we need, we only look at, you know, and I'll talk to both, you know, next cube and Sway. So next yep. cube, you know, we need, definitely need to have an MVP in place. We definitely, you know, ideally look for companies that are post-revenue. That's not to say, you know, that that is a universal case, but definitely, you know, we look for leadership position and how quickly they can scale how passionate they are, you know, and, and what kind of mode they have. That is very critical, right? So if they have an IP. Uh, but, you know, but most importantly, you know, it's a combination of things and, and you know, how much, you know, of, you know, gut and spine, you know, and perseverance the guy you have had, guys have had, at the end of the day, you know, and I'm sure you have encountered this in the past, uh, Dhawal is we all bet on investors, right? There is no, you know, guaranteed, you know, this is not like, you know, you're investing in a bond, you know, your money is protected. It's not that way, right? So you have to, right. you, know, Absolutely. Day, you know, you know, we are looking, we are betting on the, the founders, you know, but, but, if they have, you know, some big people, you know, who have had success as entrepreneurs or a corporate backer, those yeah. things, you know, would definitely uh, would help them. That would be big. And yeah, um, you're you're absolutely right. A lot of times, you know, the founder um, doesn't necessarily have to be the best operator, but they have to have that perseverance. They have to have that drive. And, you know, uh, because one thing we know is, uh, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you've gone through this process, you're going to come across a lot of challenges. Uh, and, and it's still, you know, waking up every morning, 
uh, brushing yourself off and keep pushing, right? That, that's, that, that's the skill set that's often lacking in, in the folks that don't succeed. And I also want to highlight another important point too. Uh, sometimes what happens in, and I've seen some tremendous companies fail, uh, it's very important, you know, to, we never, you know, it's very rare that, you know, we bet on entrepreneurs, you know, which is controlled by one single founder. Mm -hmm. We always, you know, look for, you know, multiple founders, you know, for, for one reason is, Sometimes, you know, success can get into the heads of founders and they become very inflexible and they, they become closed minded. And I've seen some very smart companies fail. And sometimes you know, it could be multiple founders too. Right. So there are two things, you know, one is the founders, you know, should be open minded to, you know, let some of the control go. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, that they let control go of the company that they're building because, you know, they need to, you know, leave, you know, the allowance, you know, for future investors, you know, for future strategic partners, for, you know, uh, for the right level of, you know, investors and strategic partners could even be CVCs, uh, you know, or team members who come on. But sometimes what happens is that, you know, two or more founders, you know, can become, you know, such a control freak, you know, that they become very close minded and they, you know, don't let other people come in or, you know, it could become in fighting yep. within the founders, you know, and that could lead to failures that could, you know, lead to lack of focus. And at the end of the day, the smartest ideas only succeed, you know, if you operate, execute, and scale properly. Absolutely. Once you get into some of the wrong dynamics, lack of focus, you know, that's a recipe, you know, for quickly, you know, that can, you know, spiral and snowball and, you know, businesses can fail. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that, that's, that's another big thing because founders have to realize that, you know, if they are thinking about a five, 10 year journey, um, there's a good chance at some point you might have to bring in a professional operator, maybe a CEO, maybe an executive team, where you now have to sort of sit back and let them take the company to the next level, because not all founders are, you know, capable of that. And That's very well said. That's very yeah. well said, because most of the times we've seen found, founders you know, have are the best, you know, innovators and idea creators, right? Mm -hmm. They, you know, it takes another level of skill set, you know, to to do business development, to sell, yep. to scale, to operate, to exactly. set up the right, you know, to set up the right strategic partnerships. You know, sometimes, you know, you need a big, you know, player, like take, for example, you know, in the world of fintech, you know, I mean, you may need a Goldman Sachs or a, or a Morgan Stanley as a partner, then, you know, you need to have the savvy, you know, to let them, you know, scale the business, you know, and you stick to your strengths. Because, right. you know, you're not going to be able to take up on the institutional capabilities of a Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley or a JP Morgan. Right. So no, that, absolutely. Yep. And, and that, I think that's another very important skill that a founder needs to have. Know your strengths and more importantly, know your weaknesses so you can let other people take care of those weaknesses. You can't do it all. <laughs> you can't do it all. Yep, absolutely. Um, so now let's talk about companies that are slightly more mature that have uh, you know, revenue or you know, now going into series A, B uh, round, uh, uh, fundraising rounds. Um, what is the advice at that point? Um, let's say now, you know, if the, uh, the founder is still around, he might have a C CEO or a CEO who's more experienced. Now they have an executive team that's really fun functioning. What's the next challenge that you sort of have to focus them on? And how, how do they uh, scale their business uh, from that point forward? So that's a good question, right? So once you reach series A, B, C level, so, you know, you, 
from the early days you've grown enough you know so now it's all about you know scaling the business you know if you and building your moat you know if you have you know that a product that as well that has you know uh, has beginning to work well you know now we have to realize you know how to you know enhance the the penet- the penetrability of the product you know how mm-hmm. to you know cross sell upsell build the right partnerships how to expand the product portfolio you know how to you know enhance the uh now if you if you if you have been fortunate you know to have market leadership position you need to think you know how you can expand on that you know look at you know new revenue streams look at you know new potential areas you know where you know with i'll give an example you know in uh, in financial services i give an example in healthcare as well so you know if you have let's go to healthcare you know so let's say you know i have a software enable you know a pharmaceutical company you know which based on you know an ai ml platform you know you found a new is called you know a new uh, nde is called you know new drug you know enhancement mm-hmm. uh, initiative so what they do is you know based on the research you know both based on the ip the pattern that they have had through fda for 10 years or 15 years they found they find you know a new area of application which could be with a minor tweak in the original you know formulation of the drug they find another use case you know which could be like a half a half a billion or a billion or 2 2 billion dollar market yep. so that drug enhancement you know going through the fda process in you know, could be a 6 to 12 month process getting fda approval cuz they had already had and case in point you know let's say you know lipitor you know which used to be you know a blockbuster drug for pfizer for years yep so they have made some tweaks in the original formulation of uh you know the lipitor drug you know and which you know they have built it you know into multi hundred millions of you know i mean they can get you know a patent for a couple of years but it still you know becomes you know substantial you know revenue stream for them right so really you know companies you know are are on series b c have to you know uh innovate similarly you know the series b company whose name i can't reveal you know they are in trade finance space you know they're still in stealth mode they're doing about a million in revenues but that company you know has built their moat around you know trade financing you know and invoice receivables mm-hmm. uh you know in uh, you know settlements of payments in trade financing you know in a pre trade post trade scenario right but you know now they are moving into uh some you know some other areas you know like uh, they were purely in the areas of financial services but now they're getting into uh you know insurance businesses they're getting into a uh, healthcare uh, payments business they are okay. getting into uh, medical uh, you know billing arena you know where they're trying to uh get you know pre approvals to a certain extent because you know uh so they can fast track you know especially in uh, hmo kind of scenarios that people have to wait for a longer haul to mm-hmm. get in you know to get in front of a physician yep. if so you know they're using their blockchain platform you know to get financial approval to to a you know for a minimum payment you know so they can break right. you know and get in front of the doctor sooner so so this is an i use case they didn't think of about 6 to 9 months ago right but they are working with an asset manager you know who gave them this business idea and now you know they are doing a couple of you know uh uh what should i say uh, prototypes you know or, uh, or a dry run 
Right, right, right. That's such a great point that, you know, uh, at, at some point, you know, founders need to open their vision and look for those, uh, you know, uh, follow on products or products that are complementary yep. to their current yep. service. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic piece of advice. Um, and now, I also want to touch on the investor side. So you've been an investor for a very long time. Uh, you, you've sort of uh, advised a lot of uh, founders. If there are investors that are just starting out, let's say they're about to write their first, maybe second or third check, what piece of advice can you give them to sort of help them make that decision faster or help them sort of step into that role uh, more prepared? So as an investor, of course, you know, you have your, if you're an individual investor or even an institutional investor, you know, it's all, we live in a world, you know, where we need, you know, collective intelligence, a group intelligence. So mm. as an individual investor, you want to surround yourself, you know, by fellow investors, you know, whose investment themes, not only, you know, completely overlap with yours, but also, you know, expands and is more diverse, you know, in in uh, adjacent areas. But today's world, you know, is all about, you know, networking, staying with, you know, uh, people who are smarter than you. You know, even, you know, like, you know, I'm part of a, two or three different angel groups. I'm part of Thai. Mm -hmm. I'm part of... Uh, NextCube itself is a large investor ecosystem. I'm part of Kiritsu Forum in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So the way these things work, you know, is it's all syndication, right? So you come mm -hmm. in with uh, fellow investors, uh, you know, stay on top of the latest trends, but, you know, also, you know, use syndicated deals and, you know, use a collective, you know, collective forum, you know, of how, you know, it's all, you know, again, built on top of technology, you know, and, uh, you know, building up, you know, repository, you know, and using, harnessing the power of, you know, data analytics, intelligence, and learning AI, ML, right? So yep. even at NextCube, that's what we are doing. You know, we are, we have built our own house, you know, uh, intelligent engine, you know, it's homegrown, uh, what should I say, proprietary system. But then, you know, we partner with about, you know, 200 plus other, you know, we have what's called an investor advisory board. We have close to 100 plus institutional investors, you oh, know, wow. whom we work with. We share intelligence, right. you know, we, you know, look at, you know, their due diligence, you know, uh, analytics framework, you know, we share each other's, you know, due diligence, uh, you know, paperwork, etc. So, you know, that gives, of course, you know, you have to be, you know, part of a paid membership in these kind of groups to have that kind mm -hmm. of intelligence. But that's how, you know, you you add, you know, to your collective intelligence. That's what is happening even at Thai Angel, right? So we have, yeah. you know, we're coming together as a team, but then, you know, and that's exactly what you have in mind as well. Yep. With, uh, with uh, Startup Startup Story. Story. Yeah, absolutely. That's the idea that, you know, people need to work together. So uh, the best way to learn is by example, right? So you watch someone else, ask them a bunch of questions. Why did you do that? How did you do that? And then you can sort of start to develop your own investment philosophy uh, and use that collective intelligence to make decisions. Uh, yep. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Another important thing yep. you would also advise investors, you know, always keep on top of trends mm. you know, like in today's world, you know, in, in healthcare right now, everything around digital health, telemedicine, telehealth, uh, peer, you know, peer provider, you know, how yeah. healthcare is all about outcome, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about, you know, how the idea is, you know, to keep people out of the hospital. The idea is to keep people, you know, outside of, you know, take it to a point of, you know, quality of life, you know, wellness. And so, you know, the idea is, you know, to keep people 
away from you know going to hospitals away from in you know, emergency care centers urgent care hospitalization etc even for seniors you know it's all about harnessing the power you know of ai ml you know massive amounts of you know of information that has been gathered you know in public private databases you know clinical trials you know from preclinical all the way to post clinical right. all these studies you know and you know and nih you know and all these cutting edge you know university research you know from john hopkins to duke to harvard to stanford so much information out there you know it's all about you know putting all of this you know integrate all this information that we have had for you know for years and decades and you know bring the intelligence out but drive down the healthcare costs yep and you know keep people out of the hospital and have better outcomes that's on the healthcare side and the payer side on the drug design drug discovery side fda you know one important trend I wanted to tell you fda you know is trying to as you know when i came into healthcare a decade plus ago it would be 1.5 1.6 billion dollars over 10 years for a drug to go from you know cradle to grave right right either you go from cradle to heaven or you go from cradle to grave one <laughs> of the two right right so today you know that you know that cost is touching 2.5 to 3 billion dollars for a yep. patent drug yeah but fda you know is now harnessing the power of digital you know platforms ai ml cloud you know deep analytics predictive analytics you know computer vision you know all this you know massive you know genomics and uh, you know bioinformatics and uh, trends analysis uh, predictive analytics uh and you know so all of this you know and they are training their physicians we are seeing a lot of mds going into in the business side we having you know a lot of people from fda you know now going and working in the field mm-hmm. in that case an example you know is what has happened in the last year in 9 months we have had three drugs in the us that have come to market for covid yep exactly Actually, you know it would take 5 years or longer yep. we have moderna's medicine pfizer biontech and j and j just J&J. happened last month yep. and then in europe it was astrazeneca yep so in nine yeah in yeah just about a year you know i think worldwide now we have i don't know probably half a billion people already vaccinated yeah absolutely which is incredible it's all technology incredible incredible i'm not saying it alone right it's a whole slew of technologies right biotech yeah. bioinformatics genomics yeah no ai yeah. ml genomics i think is a huge plus too yeah i mean yeah. all of these uh the the medtech field maybe not medtech maybe medicine as a whole is such a vibrant field there are so many new innovations happening so many new companies that are coming in um yeah it's uh the best thing an investor can do is obviously educate themselves and stay on yeah. top of trends like you said yeah and uh, fantastic at, advice diversify your assets too you know yep. like we did not even talk about you know the future of work we did not talk about <laughs> you know because the way we work today you know uh yeah. uh logistics supply chain is going to be transformed absolutely absolutely just this okay. past year yeah. you know uh literally 12 months ago barely a handful of people had heard of zoom and today right. everyone's on zoom <laughs> right, right? Uh, and uh, you know same thing goes for slack and all of these other uh slack. remote working tools imagine yeah 27 billion dollar acquisition incredible right incredible <laughs> um but yeah uh so a uh, lot of innovation happening so i guess investors the best thing you, you, they can do is educate themselves cyber um, security is another cyber security yeah now everybody being remote yeah that that's a huge field and um, all the all the issues we've had right you know yeah. the microsoft hack 2 weeks ago and before that you know uh the uh the fire what, what is it the fire eye yeah uh yeah 
Uh, <laughs> Why am I backing out? Uh, storm. Uh, storm mines. Storm. Uh, I'm. I'm blanking out. Um, Cyber security. <laughs> Fire Eye is one. Fire Eye is right. Fire Eye. That's what I was but thinking. But the company about. whose software was hacked. That's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, I, solar winds. Solar wind. There you go. Solar winds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and uh, there's uh, so many uh, changes that are coming down this pipe. You know, a lot of these are software, but now we're starting to also see some hardware hacks that are coming through. Yeah. And people actually changing chips and things like that. So yeah, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting future. Absolutely. Um, Let's uh, let's end the interview with an action step for an, uh, for founders and for startups. You know, they when founders are looking for their investor, looking for the uh, either the anchor investor or are looking for additional investors. If they come to you, what is the most important thing that they need to have? They, this is a box that they have to check before they even contact you. Because if it's not checked, you're not even going to reply to their email. What is that most important thing for you? Uh, do your research. Investors are becoming extremely sophisticated, you know, because of technology. The world of investing investing is becoming more and more niche. Mm -hmm. now, to give an example, now we are getting into investors, investors, you know, who are only doing cybersecurity. There are investors who are only doing med devices. Yeah. There are investors in fintech who are only wanting to do uh, blockchain, mm -hmm. or they only want to do AI, ML, and uh, cloud. Yep. So when I came to Nextcube, we were doing A to Z in tech. Yep. Now we are only doing four or five. So investors yeah. are becoming very sophisticated to, to going back to first startups. I, you know, I would, I'm, I'll, I'll send you an email, you know, I would, this was done by John Doerr, John Doerr and Guy Kawasaki, you know, who started Garage Ventures. Yep. They have 10 to 12, you know, critical, you know, fundamental dimensions, you know, or essential points that every startup should look at, no matter what stage you're in. It could be, you know, pre-seed or you could be series C. Right. Those 10 steps never stop. They always have to look at it, but do, do your homework and target your investors. The way investors target startups, yep. startups should target investors. Absolutely. And do that homework, look at their thesis and look for, what they bring more than money they should bring yep. you know strategic value operations execution customer access yep absolutely and, and i think the biggest thing is that if you study your industry as a founder if you study your industry you see all of these trends it will actually better prepare you to take advantage of the product you're developing you'll be able to see things that other cannot see and when you're talking to these investors now, I, I know Nextcube is, you know, you said you, they're focusing in on four industries, but now uh, all of the, even the larger VCs have specialized teams for each industry, right? So exactly. if, if you go to them, they will say, oh, you're AIML, you talk to, you know, John Smith, because John Smith is an expert in AIML. And if you are not an expert in AIML, you'll be discovered like that. That's right. And then you forget uh, forget uh, yep. your chances of getting an investment. Yep. That's research not companies, happen. research the focus areas, and research people in the firms. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the more you Great know, advice. Everything, everything is at the fingertips these days. Everything is in LinkedIn. It's on the website. Things are, you know, you Google, you get yep. hundreds of, you know, hits. Yep. So exactly. information is out there, you know. So do research and use your networks. Yep. And yeah. So be and keep networking. Networking is very important. Yep. 
and there are industry specific publications. So read yep. those and uh, make yep. sure you know exactly what's going on. Yep. And research people. Like let's say you know people. Yeah. I am a startup, and you know, I'm going to come to Dhaval. Dhaval is a venture partner. You're one of the GPs, and I have to do full research. You know, the more I know about you, yep, better, right? You know, I I exactly. love to see which panels you are in, what papers you have published. You know, what's uh, venture capitalists are thought leaders. You know, look at you know, you know what resonates with them, right? You know, you have to yep. connect. And you know, try to speak to your audience. Basically, a performing. Exactly. To me, yep. it's like I'm an, a startup guy. You know, it's like I'm on I'm on Broadway. I'm performing to my audience. Right. If I don't perform, you know, I'm going to be a flop. Right. If the investor doesn't make that connection right away, then that's it. That's right. There's a, there's no reply to the email. There's no second chance. Yep. I I'll be a one movie. I won't be a one movie wonder. I'll be a one movie uh, disaster. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, great, great point. And uh, Raghu, thank you so much for taking the time today. I, I know we went a little bit over on time, but I, you were giving such great advice. I, I didn't want to stop you. So uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and uh, for doing the interview and sharing your wisdom with the audience. Um, any parting thoughts? Anything you want to leave us with? No, Dhawal, it's been an absolute honor, an absolute privilege, and I look forward, you know, to to building our, you know, friendship, you know, with you, with you know, Startup Steroid and the wonderful companies, you know, you're bringing, and you know, I would love to, you know, help you, you know, in scaling and growing Startup Steroid and uh, Thai uh, Southwest okay. LA as well as a uh, Thai uh, fund in, uh, you know. A Thai angel uh, yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're, I'm going to take you up on all of those offers. <laughs> I'll be calling you. Uh, yep. Thank you so much, Raghu. Uh, talk soon. Yep. Have a, have a good right. Sunday.